And now we are back live at ringside. And this outdoor arena at the Mirage has baked in the sun all day long. It's beginning to cool off as you look at that. Look at a couple of adoptive Angelinos, Sugar Ray Leonard and Magic Johnson, sitting together at ringside. This is a star-studded crowd tonight, Larry and George. Ah, uh, look at that. Well, it's filled with some real fight fans who, who understand that they're watching two of the top three or four fighters in the ring. And there comes Meldrick Taylor in the tiger-striped hooded outfit. And you see that he attempts to become the sixth welterweight champion to win the super welterweight title. He also guns for what would be the third championship of his career in a third separate weight class. And accompanying Taylor into the ring, the terrific corner of co-manager and co-trainer Lou Duba and the second co-trainer George Benton who is really the primary architect of Meldrick Taylor's style, Larry. Right, because he is a Philadelphia, he was a Philadelphia fighter himself and he said an interesting thing to me this morning. He said that the best thing that has happened to Meldrick Taylor was fighting two really tough, strong welterweights in Aaron Davis and Glenwood Brown because he's finally learned that he has to reduce some of that Philadelphia relentless aggressiveness, be occasionally smart about his fighting and not just stick his chin out there. And above and beyond that, he opted for bigger, stronger sparring partners with an eye toward preparing for Norris's power. The only downside being that he was knocked down in sparring in getting ready for this fight. Now, I've always measured fighters, George, not by whether they get knocked down because if if you're a real fighter, you're going to get knocked down. But by what happens next? Do you get up? Do you fight back? Do you, do you learn how to adapt to the new circumstances? You adapt and you're going to be a great champion. There's the record for Meldrick Taylor. 29 wins, the one loss to Chavez in March of 1990. The draw with Howard Davis early in his career was actually regarded as a plus, not a minus at that time. 15 knockouts, but only one since he moved up to 147 pounds. And tonight, he agreed to a weight limit of 150 and a half pounds, Roger. midway between his welterweight level and the 154 pound level at which Terry Norris won a world championship. Here's a list of the champions that Taylor has fought in his career, all three of those fights against champions went into the 12th round. And conceivably that's significant or could be significant because Taylor knows what it is to have a hard, tough fight that goes the distance. Norris hasn't yet to experience that. At least certainly against an opponent the quality of Meldrick Taylor. And now from the opposite side of the arena, Terry Norris leaves his dressing room and prepares to enter the ring. Soft-spoken, relatively quiet, a small-town guy from Lubbock, Texas, now living in Alpine, a suburb of San Diego, and training in the tiny town of Campo near the Mexican border. And while, while Meldrick Taylor is famous as a Philadelphia fighter, with coming out of that Philadelphia fight culture, Meldrick, uh, Terry Norris, as a Texan, has his own tradition that he's come out of, and that's a family tradition. His father was a fighter, his brother is still a fighter, was a ranked heavyweight at one time, and that really does count for something. And, of course, George Foreman will be the first to tell us that there are a lot of Texans who think they can fight just as well as Philadelphia. Nah, you better believe it. But I think Norris may be the big fish out of the sea going into the little stream because of those four pounds to the ordinary person who loses lose four pounds as nothing. But when you lose four pounds and you jump in that ring in another class, dangerous things can happen to you. Terry Norris argues that coming down from 154 to 150 and a half isn't that difficult for him. He normally fights at 152 anyway. But as you'll see in a moment, there was a surprise at this morning's weigh-in, and it may not have augured in Norris's favor, despite the rising odds which favor him in the legal bookmaking parlors here. There's the record for Terry Norris. Of the three losses, two were earlier in his career, one by disqualification. You almost throw them out given his level of class now. The one that really changed him was a second round knockout at the hands of the hard punching Julian Jackson. And like Taylor, he took a lesson from that and he's been a better fighter ever since that fight. Champions fought. Terry Norris has been in with seven of them. Once again, Donald Curry, Ray Leonard and John the Beast Mugabe were all functionally at the end of their careers when Norris defeated them.
anybody read yet what Norris has carved into the back of his haircut today? Yes, it says knockout. And he has confided to friends that he hopes and expects to win the fight by a knockout. Tail of the tape, Norris is three and a half inches taller, has eight inches more reach. Stunningly, Terry Norris weighed in at only 149 pounds, equal to Taylor's weight. A look at the weigh-in, Larry. Yes, and he had about a pound of stuff on him as well. 149 and he may pounds, have Terry Norris. For this big, big fight of his career, which could be telling if we do have a long, grueling fight. Norris's handlers say they have trouble keeping him out of the gym between fights. He is so eager to spar and to train all the time. Will it have hurt him tonight? We will soon see. Punch stat numbers, Larry. Well, here are the numbers, and we can see that both fighters are very active. Taylor has actually reduced the number of punches he has thrown in recent fights. They both throw a lot of fights and land a high percentage. But here from the jabs, you can see that Norris throws fewer jabs, lands more harder punches. And rules for the bout from our unofficial scorer at ringside, Harold Letterman. Jim, Larry. terrible Terry Norris and Meldrick Taylor will fight tonight using the rules of the World Boxing Council. Three judges scoring the fight on a 10-point must system. There is no standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. You can be saved by the bell in the last round only. Only the referee can stop the fight. The doctor can't stop it. And in case a cut is caused by an accidental headbutt. And that butt causes the fight to be stopped. That cut causes the fight to be stopped. We'll go to the scorecards after the third round has been completed. Before that, it's a technical draw. Jim? Right now, let's go up to ring announcer Michael Buffer for the pre-fight introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, just recently, a member of the boxing fraternity passed away. He was a man of great dignity and charisma as he plied his trade in the very center of the ring. He was a ring announcer who brought showmanship into the ring as he was well known as a big band singer. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, would everyone please remain silent as we told the final count of ten for the man known as the voice of boxing for 40 years. Mr. Jimmy Lennon. God bless you, Jimmy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Main Events Monitor Productions, along with Algoosin Promotions, in association with the undisputed, undefeated King of Beer, Budweiser, present the featured bout of the evening. This contest is sanctioned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission, Chairman Luther Mack, Commissioners Nat Carasali, Dr. James Nave, Dr. Elias Ghanem and Bruce Lane, Executive Director Chuck Minker, and the World Boxing Council, represented ringside by Supervisor, by Nevada's own Dr. Elias Ghanem, Physicians in attendance, Dr. Flip Omansky and Dr. Al Capanna, and Dr. James McLennan. Timekeeper, Al Bicek, counting for the knockdown seconds, Jane Broadfoot. The scoring for this bout will be done by three judges assigned at ringside. They are Dalby Shirley, Franz Marti, and Mickey Van. And when the bell rings, the man in charge of all the action, working a title bout as referee for the 65th time, Mr. Mills Lane. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from the Mirage here in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Twelve rounds of boxing for the WBC Super Welterweight Championship of the World. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing the tiger skin the colors, weighing 149 pounds. This 1984 Olympic gold medal champion is 29-1-1 one one with 15 KOs as a professional, and he's held two world titles. Ladies and gentlemen, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, introducing the challenger, two-time world champion, and current WBA welterweight champion of the world, Meldrick TNT Taylor. And his opponent across the ring fighting out of the red corner, 
wearing the red and white trunks, weighing 149 pounds. He brings an outstanding professional record into the ring tonight with 31 victories, 17 by KO, against only three defeats. From Campo, California, ladies and gentlemen, presenting the WBC Super Welterweight Champion of the World, Terrible Terry Norris. This is for the championship of the world. We've already gone through all the instructions. I expect a tough, clean fight. Any questions from the challenger? Nope. Any questions from the champion? Let's get it on. Well, you got let's get ready to rumble. You got let's get it on. Need we say any more? Yeah, there's two questions going into this fight. One, in the early rounds, can Taylor take Norris's punch? As the fight goes along, can Norris take the pace of a tough, long fight. Meldrick Taylor sprints from his corner. The speculation is that a faster pace will favor Taylor. A slower pace might give Norris more chance to marshal his efforts for the knockout he wants to see. Body punching from Taylor to begin the fight. Meldrick lands a long right hand, tries to follow with the left. Pawing with the jab. Norris, the slower starter. He has a history of slow starts in rounds one, two, and three. Stunning left hook to the body by Taylor. I think Norris is filling him out just a little too long. The fight just started, George. <laughs> but Taylor has come out of the blocks very fast. If the first round is to be a statement, clearly Meldrick Taylor wants to state that this will be a boxing match on his terms. He does not want to gear, go near the ropes with Terry Norris. Norris slow to release his punches and missing so far. Meldrick Taylor beating him to the punch. Now Norris lands a short right hand inside. The more Taylor throws, the more he makes himself available for counter punches, and Terry Norris is a good counter puncher once he gets going. Norris says he's willing to take some leather because he doesn't believe Meldrick Taylor can hurt it. Norris had better believe it. So you think that's a bad idea, George? Right, he's taken a few too many shots already. <laughs> by Norris, wobbled Meldrick Taylor for just an instant. Years ago, Norris was exclusively a right-hand puncher, but the left hook has increasingly become his most effective power punch. Norris lands a right hand as they step apart, and now Terry Norris initiates an exchange for one of the first times in the bout. First minute of the fight belonged exclusively to Taylor. Things have been evening up a little bit since then. Both punchers landing effectively there. As Taylor steps inside, he's giving Norris a chance to counter with short left hooks to the chin. Right hand counter landed for Norris. Terry looking much sharper in the last minute of the round than he did to start out. That was state of the art boxing, and it figures to get better. All right. That's right. beautiful the first round. Right, now listen, now go out there and handle the same way this round. You understand? Just go do the same thing you're doing this round. Make it miss, make it pay. Right. Now look. Double and triple on that chair. Now settle down a little more. Settle down a little more. See, read this guy. Look at me on the seat there. Just place it like a radar. Are you going to try to run in? Okay. Get up, cut. Alright. Let it flow, sir. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
In Taylor's corner, they're talking about make a miss, then make him pay. In Norris's corner, look for a chance to throw the uppercut. And lest you be deceived into thinking that Meldrick Taylor bleeds from the mouth through this fight, he's wearing a red mouth guard. So if you see red between his lips, it does not necessarily mean there's blood. Let's see if Norris gets a chance to launch the uppercut, which he believes can be the most effective blow in this bout. I think his corner, Taylor's corner, told him wrong to try to match jabs at this point of the fight with Norris because it's too long and he's quick with it. Norris's reach advantage, in other words, would give him the edge there. He's going to match up every time. Meldrick following instructions from George Bent, though, is trying to jab. Norris trying to come over the top with the right hand. Four straight right hands by Norris. Good body shot by Taylor. But Norris that, misses with the left hook. But that is blood, I believe, now coming from Taylor's mouth already. Hard to tell, but it might be. Recall that he bled from the mouth throughout the Chavez bout. One of the things that sent him to the hospital afterwards. A lot of times the mouthpiece is up. Solid pure. right hand by Norris, George. Right on the button. What about the mouthpiece? The mouthpiece is sometimes are built incorrectly, and it'll cause your lips to start bleeding prematurely, and you're not hurt. Again, Meldrick Taylor comes forward, and again, Terry Norris tags him with the right hand. Norris is getting off with that right cross, George. There's the uppercut, and there's the uppercut again. Norris landed it twice. By attempting to jab against Norris's longer reach, Meldrick Taylor appears to have set up a good round for Terry Norris here. Lancing blow with the right hand, but Taylor steps back because he knows the power that Norris packs. Norris seems to be showing no respect for Taylor's punching power at all, George. And Taylor has reverted back to old Philadelphia style. Hit me two, I'll get you one later. George, what can Meldrick do to prevent Norris from landing that short, chopping right hand? Taylor's got to go strictly defensive, if you ask me right now. Stop trying to match punches with the guy. Let him th rule for a few minutes, the first couple of rounds. Get him later on. Taylor missed with the long right. Norris came back with the uppercut and landed it. That time, Norris missed with the left uppercut. Taylor standing more stationary than we might have expected and still trying to jab, not being effective because he can't get it there. Round two coming to a close. It has been a very effective chapter for Terry Norris. Don't back up for a round, you understand? Hey, you get He's down. trying to nail you with the right hand. See what I mean? That would just keep the double and triple the jab. So you can't get the right hand over. You got me covered? Uh -huh. All right. Yep. All right. Roger. Mel, right now when you get close, you hustle. The guy can't beat you on the inside, so you're all right inside, I'm telling you. You understand? Your body punch is coming along good. Keep it up. Coming but up. jab you. Relax. Relax. Your mouth's already busted. Can you come up? Always in working mode. That's all we are. Now here is Norris in his most effective early in the round. A straight right hand, and then followed by another one. But neither one budged Taylor. Keep that in mind. Neither one budged Taylor. They certainly got his attention, but he hasn't just fallen over. Round three, WBC super welterweight champion Terry Norris defending his title against WBA welterweight champion Meldrick Taylor. They begin round three with a jabbing contest. And George Foreman between rounds, George Benson told Meldrick Taylor to stick with the jab and you shook your head. No way. He's got to hit and move out of the way. Hit and move out of the way constantly. That's his only hope. Well, as they traded punches there, Meldrick Taylor got in a left hook that may have been his most effective blow. And now for the moment, Taylor seizes command and steps inside. Norris missing twice with the right hand. Got a glancing land with it once. Left 
to the body by Norris was good. Right hand by Norris on the button. Meldrick doesn't have a lot of commitment to the jab, George. No, and he should never. He's standing still because his corner told him to use this jab. If they had told him to hit and run away, he would have a better chance at this point. Meldrick got off to a good start in this round, but now Terry Norris is taking over again. And Meldrick looks a little flustered by Norris's willingness to just wail away with power shots. Don't know how long Terry Norris can bounce like that, though. He only bounces when he's extra confident. Now, Mills Lane gets ready to talk about low blows again, and Meldrick Taylor argues, no, no, I didn't get him low. Right hand lands. And Taylor sticks his tongue out at him and says, I took your shot, you didn't get me. Well, that usually means just the opposite. Good lefts to the body by Taylor, two of them in sequence. That's where I think he has to go, George, inside and to the body. That's right, and out of the way, because if this fight goes the distance, those body punches are going to start to hurt and wear down Terry Norris, bouncing around with his legs. Particularly if Norris, as we suspect might be the case, is overtrained and ill-prepared to stretch himself to 12 rounds in this heat. There's the right again, sneaking over the top of Taylor's left. Meltrick again with the smile on his face. I'm not sure the message will get across if Terry Norris keeps landing this way. And for the moment, the blinding hand speed of Meltrick Taylor has been neutralized as he waits outside for Terry Norris to step forward with power shots. Norris, I feel, is fighting the fight that Mildred Taylor should be fighting. Move, hit a few, and get out of the way. Okay. Taylor is notorious for loving to eat between fights, but he's eating too many of those right hands in this fight right now. I think I'll land every time. We just got to do more often. All right. Deep breath. Now we start going in the body. Okay. Good that hook. Make sure right hand is up because he's going to counter with the hook. All right. Get up. All right. Okay. You understand? Now don't be on the outside. Now you got to move up, but you got to move up behind the left hand. Okay. See? Don't be hanging outside. This guy's trying to hit you with a long punch. So you're on the outside too much. You got to jab your way in, jab his chest, then go to the bottom. Yeah, now don't, don't look. Don't move up in a crouch. Okay, let's take a look. There's a nice left hand by Norris to the body. But the right hand to the, the long looping right hand, it, hit, it isn't hitting Taylor flush, but it's effective. It's scoring and it piles up points. And it messes up the ears so you can't hear your instructions that way. <laughs> and Meldrick doesn't seem to know yet how to neutralize it. As you heard his corner, they want him to jab his way and get in at close quarters where Taylor doesn't want to be. Right hand punch landed Norris for Meldrick play. Taylor as he stepped in. So again, Norris takes a full shot from Taylor. And again, Norris tries to come back. Right hand landed for Taylor. And for Norris. This fight is everything it was supposed to be. Isn't it? Good solid left in close by Taylor. A right hand by Norris in exchange. Again the right hand lands for Norris. Taylor's left not there to block it. Overhand right. Taylor Wobbly. Four, five, six, seven. I know you are. I know you are. Now remember that in his last title defense, Meldrick Taylor was twice knocked down by Glenwood Brown. These are right hands by Norris that have done the damage. Norris, of course, has invested into some good body shots also. Solid left hand. Meldrick swinging wildly, leaving himself wide open. Norris missed an easy shot. Plenty of time left in the round. The word on the back of Terry Norris's haircut is knockout. And that's what he's thinking about right now. Lou Duba yelling for 
for Meldrick Taylor to clinch, but Meldrick keeps throwing leather and dropping his hands. Morris with the uppercut landed. He's trying to measure him and take a shot. It's about pure hard now. Come on, Meldrick! Skills went out of the window. Meldrick still wobbly in there, George. Put that jab up there! Should he be grabbing and clinching? He should, but he's got too much heart and soul. He's Philadelphia bred and trained. He doesn't know how to clinch. He thinks that as Norris throws, he's going to get a chance to land one in return. Norris with another solid right. Meldrick is woozy on the ropes. Second knockdown. There'll be about 20 seconds left when the count is complete. Here comes Terry Norris to try to finish him off. There's no, there's no free knockdown rule. Keep that in mind. And there's no quit in Meldrick Taylor. A decision for Lane to make. He's very close to stopping it. And there it is. Rightful decision. wouldn't let him. Mills Lane with a very tough decision, and you say, George, a good one. A good decision. He's a young fighter. He still has a future ahead of him. He was fighting a bigger man. He didn't take an extra beating. <laughs> I think He'll it was back. a case of too much heart, Larry. Well, that's what we said earlier, that when champions fight, their instinct is when they get hit, they're going to hit the other guy back. That's what has made these kinds of fights so action-filled. Uh, somewhat slightly reminiscent in another way of uh, Hearns and Hadler. They just both came out, they boxed very hard, but uh, Terry Norris found that he could land that right hand, and as, as uh, Taylor tried to get in close. Right on top of the head, strange that a middleweight fighter can knock you down in that fashion. If you remember between rounds, Georgie Benton told Taylor, you must jab your way and get in close. But when he got in close, he got nailed. That's the danger of getting in close, George. It was that shot right by the ear. So Norris is indeed a clever boxer. He's a puncher. Now let's take a look at the second knockdown. We're gonna, from some different angles. There was probably the hardest punch of the lot. And you can see Taylor is hurt. And a punch on top of the head sends him reeling. He's off balance. Dazed. Who gives you instructions for when you're hurt? Only your heart and only your memory can give you those instructions. And those shots, the first one was right on the, between the chin and the cheekbone, which is hard to recover from. Interestingly, Terry Norris has a history of hitting fighters when they're down. He got disqualified for it once. He did it to both Leonard and Curry. He managed to restrain himself here, even though he had two free shots at Taylor as Taylor was going down. Yeah, you practice for months and months. That's a hard thing to control. There's Mills Lane stepping in with the final decision. He was in a neutral corner when he made the stoppage, and here was the reaction of Lou Duba as Mills Lane got ready to stop the bout. Lou Duba, who roots so hard for his fighters, George, who wants so much for them in his heart. Kind of half-hearted. He kind of half-hearted. He, he loves these young men as his son. Never been a trainer that loves his fighters as much as this guy. That was a no that sounded almost as much like a yes. And we'll take a look at final punch stat numbers, I think, which will indicate to you that Terry Norris landed an increasing number of power blows through the bout. Norris was throwing toward the end exclusively right hands over the top, left hooks and left uppercuts. And there you see that Taylor threw an extraordinary 302 blows, but landed only 26% and could not hold off the power of Terry Norris. Now let's go up to ring announcer Michael Buff for the official particulars. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Mills Lane steps in to stop this contest at 2 minutes and 55 seconds into round number 5. The winner and still 
WBC Super Welterweight Champion of the World, Terrible Terry Norris. A look at a very, very disappointed, probably heartbroken Meldrick Taylor. And Larry Merchant stands by with the victorious Terry Norris. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, and congratulations, Terry. What transpired in the fight that let you know that you could hit him with so many clean right hands? Well, he came out you know, uh, flat-footed. I thought he was going to move a lot more. And uh, I, knew in, I knew he was dropping his right hand, but his jab hand, I was coming over. And then he would, when he bring it back real low, so I just kept throwing the right hand. When I heard him with one, well, I think it was a hook I heard him with, and I just finished him off and started throwing right hands. I knew he was vulnerable for him. You had knockout carved into your hair for this fight. Why were you convinced that you would come to the ending that, in fact, you did? Uh, the reason is because I, I had, you know, he's, he's, I'm a bigger guy. They talk a lot of stuff talking about he's going to stand flat-footed and fight me. And he did that. That was his mistake, and I caught him. I knew if he stood right, right in front of me, I'd knock him out. Let's take a look at these knockdowns, and, Terry, you describe what was going through your mind and what happened here. Right here, I'm just basically trying to set him up with a jab. New mine's right, and caught him with a right hand, good right hand. I was trying to catch him with the uppercuts all day, but he was missing him by a little bit. Another right hand, they caught him. I saw him buckle, and that's when I went with the right hands. I was constantly trying to land those right hands on him, take him out. All right, now we're going to go to the second knockdown. Tell us what happened there. How did you know that it was near the end? I knew it was near the end because you know, I'm a good finisher. I just set him up set him up and start catching him with the right hands again. I knew he couldn't get away from him, so I just kept throwing the right hand. Jab right hand. All right, now we're going to take a look at the end of the fight. There were five seconds left in the round. Do you think that the referee did the best thing by stopping the fight there? I think so, because Austin just jump on him and start, you know, you know, nothing but punches, a lot of, a lot of punches. And I was just going to keep keying off on him until the referee stopped. So I, it was luckily the referee stepped in before I hurt him badly. You think in the end it was simply that you were just too strong for him? I believe so. You know, I, you know, I was walking right through his punches. I, I told him in press conference if he uh, pity pad with me, I'll walk right through him, and that's what, exactly what I did. All right. What What are your plans now? Do you want to go and fight for the middleweight championship? Who is in your sights? Well, right now, you know, uh, I came in 150, 148 for this fight. I'm making down a welterweight fight. Somebody there. I have no idea right now. Maybe go up to the middleweight, fight someone there. But I'm just, right now, I'm going to take me a little rest, and then we'll go back to the managers and trainers, and then we'll decide. Thank you. That was terrific stuff, Terry. We'll see you again for sure. Back to you, Jim and George. Okay. All right, so in the end, it was the dreaded conventional wisdom where boxing skills were relatively even, hand speed relatively equal. Power made the difference. Must make you feel good. This big man is strange to lose so much weight and have the power of a heavyweight. It's strange, but Norris has it. Part of uh, that seems to me, George, that he throws his power punches with such reckless abandon. He's really fearless in there. Willing to really commit to every right and left hand when he throws for Not power. cautious at all. I couldn't believe it. Going into a great fighter like uh, this guy, Taylor. He's a great fighter, but he went in not caring, and he won the fight. To How a certain degree, Taylor strength? made it easy for him. You That's pointed right. out he, he, he thought he had the, the wrong, strategy. wrong strategy all along. Too big to stand up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this big man. Well, let's see how Meldrick feels about that as he stands by now with Larry Merchant. Larry? Okay. Okay. Meldrick. You give us your impression of what happened. Was he just too strong for you? He was too strong. He deserved to be champion. I did everything I, I, I could to get in the best shape I did. I mean, I worked very hard. And he still had you no know, call me to go punch and rob me. He's very strong, and I can't take nothing away from him. He's a, he's a great champion. By trying to get inside of him, did you make it easy for him to stand back and hit you, or was that really the only way you could fight him because of his reach and size? Well, that was my mistake, standing on, on the end of his punches. I should have stayed in closer, come in behind the jab, and close the gap and stay inside in his chest and kept working the body because I noticed when I was going to the body, I was hurting him and doubling up on my shots to the head. But it was just hard to keep staying close and keep the distance on short. You have great ambitions for yourself. You want to be not just a great fighter, but a, a great man in a way in, in prize fighting. How crushing is this defeat for you? Uh... It's my only second time in my career losing, and nobody likes to lose. But I got to take the bad with the good and show how true of a champion I am to be able to come right back. And um, right now, I'm not even going to think about considering anything right now. I'm going to take some time off 
And when it's time for me to collect my thoughts and get, get with my people and evaluate, evaluate what I'm going to do right now. But it's, it's a very hard loss for me. And for the p fans and fans and supporters that was behind me, the fact that I was going to win the fight, and I feel as though I let them down. But we can safely assume you'll be back to being a well away and you'll stay in that division. Well, I, 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 I fell short of my, my goal, my dreams, to be three-time world champion. And I'm still a champion, but it feels as though I, I still lost a very important and significant fight in my career, something that I would probably be hard to get over. Thank you very much for sharing those thoughts with us. We'll see you many times here again. Thank you, Meldrick. Thank you, Larry. Back to you again, Jim and George. You got to feel sorry for Meldrick Taylor. Uh, Julio Cesar Chavez was his emotional goal for so long. Chavez stays down at 140 pounds, won't come up to 147 to fight against Taylor. So he has to go up and wait to try to get a big shot against a bigger guy. And it probably was a failed effort from the beginning. Yeah, I think so. This guy's just too strong, this Norris. I don't know where he's get the strength from. That's why Sugar Ray Leonard never should have assessed his ability when he lost that fight. He lost to, a, like, a, an Iron Man there. You know, it's so easy for you heavyweights. You know who you're going to fight. You're all in the same division. Now the quandary for Terry Norris is, who does he fight? There's still no competition for him at 154 pounds, except for Gianfranco Rosi, an Italian. There aren't a lot of Americans who are going to pay a ton to see that. He'll either have to go up or down, probably, to get a big-name opponent, too. But believe me, there's some young boy who's lurking out there well, who's who gonna thinks come he can do something and may take it away from him a lot sooner than you think let's go back to larry merchant now with referee mills lane to talk about the tough decision to stop the fight all right i'm with mills lane the referee mills we're going to show you the end of the fight and i want you to give us your thoughts as as that evolved in the last round where taylor went down twice seemed uh, certainly seemed dazed was not out how did you see it that's right. He was not out. It was early in the fight. He was on the end of some real strong stuff. He was getting nailed solidly. He was down twice. He was up. I thought he knew where he was, but he lost control of his legs, and Norris was really teeing off on him, and it seemed to me like that it wasn't late in the fight, and, and, and he, the last three rounds, it seemed to me like he was in trouble, and I didn't see any point in going any further with the shellac he was getting to take at that time. From your point of view, this is your 65th championship fight, HBO's 100th championship fight. What was the quality of the prize fighting going on in there? That was as good a fight as you'll see. Medrick Taylor gave it all he had. Terry Norris may be one of the best in the world today, pound for pound. He's a hell of a fighter. All right, we're going to take a look at the end of the fight as soon as our people can roll it up. And then uh, you give us your thoughts as you watch it. All right. Now, Norris, he's on the long end of that one. Now he shortens up a little bit until he, he misses that one. Now he gets nailed again. Okay, that's the first knockdown. How badly did you think Taylor was hurt at that point? Right then, I didn't think he was hurt too bad. He was up. He talked to me. He said he was okay. I said, I know you're okay, but i got to give you eight. He tells me he's okay. Rolls his head. He said he's okay. He said he wants to go. He said he's okay. All right. Now he now he's back. Now Norris is. Okay, now that's a long shot. Now that's a good shot. Now underneath he gets him on the top. A left foot comes underneath. Taylor's back against the ropes. Gets hit again, solid. And that's it. And you indicate that if this was at the end of a fight and it would have been a terrific fight then you might give the benefit of the doubt. But at this stage of the fight, it's pointless. Different different issue. Last round, close to the end of the fight, different question. Thank you so much, Mills. Thank and you. back to you, Jim and George, once more. All right.